so when Governor Tim Kaine came during his uh, 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 governorship, he came about uh, three months before the end of his end of his uh, cycle, which I guess he thought it was safe to come and visit Polybase. Put him on a hay wagon, took him right around. He really got this. He, he, uh, he's quite an ecologist, Al Horseman, and he got this. He said, "Well, how can I help you?" I said, "Well, let's arrange a, let's arrange a, a, a rendezvous at the governor's mansion next week, and Polyface will lease all of your state parks so we can keep your trees healthy <laughs> with pigs." Boy, can you imagine Nature Conservancy? You know, a lease for pigs in the state parks, running through the woods. Ah! <laughs> a hand flips backwards. <laughs> So the deal is, when we talk about um, this kind of agriculture, this kind of farming, the beauty of this is that it allows us, because of the simple infrastructure, because the equity here is in management, not in infrastructure, it allows us to, to touch corners and salvage spots all over the place that could never be touched with industrial agriculture. So you can, you can plug this into little places, whether it's lawns or little uh, 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 spots, uh, woodlots. Most, most uh, people who own, you know, 75% uh, of Virginia's forest lands are NIPF. That's non-industrial private forest land. Um, and, and they are incredibly uh, unstewarded. Uh, and if you go to a forestry conference, all they have to, to, to sell you for forestry is this once a generation harvest that might pay the taxes for the 40 years between harvests. What I'm talking about here is putting pigs in, generating three to $500 per acre in, in grain displacement, and suddenly you're getting as much off of the forest annual cash flow as you do off of pasture. Now suddenly it's an economic engine that not only drives the farm's economic viability, it's an ecologic engine that drives the health of the trees, and it's aesthetically and aromatically sensually romantic. <laughs> it's very people friendly. Right? We're not repulsed by it, and um, and so this is this is the this is the model that we're using. And of course, these pigs get all their exercise. They get a lot of green material. Just uh, you know, with Weston A. Pricer here, I can't help but mention a, a little bit of other nutrition. One of the most amazing stories we just heard this spring. We learn, learn a lot from our chefs. We supply about 50 restaurants and um, about 5,000 families and uh, 10 retail outlets. And by the way, that's reverse economy. That's taking metropolitan money and sending it into the, into the rural instead of rural becoming a colonial serf or the into the urban. We're a reverse flow. We, uh, we, we bring the urban money into the rural. And um, so, so uh, as some of you know, we supply two Chipotle uh, restaurants, uh, Chipotle Mexican meals, the one in Charlottesville and the one in Harrisonburg. And um, when we had our Chef Appreciation uh, Day this spring, uh, I was talking to them, the two managers there, and um, they said it's the most amazing thing they said that um, when we get our pork from, and they get they get top quality pork otherwise from Nyman Ranch, but they said that when we get pork from any place else, we spend a lot of time separating the fat from the uh, from the meat because the fat is hard and, and gristly like you know, and so when you do pulled pork, which they use for their carnitas and fajitas and stuff, when you do pulled pork, you got to separate you know this this inedible from the edible, this this hard uh, this hard fat. That's almost like paraffin in your mouth. Said your pork, when we cook that, there is no fat. Because all the fat is so soft, it just melts into the meat, makes the meat moist. That's why we're the only pork, our, the two restaurants we service are the only two in the whole you know, 1,400 restaurant Chipotle chain that can use pork. All the rest of them only use Although your meat costs a little more 
it actually saves us so much prep time in the kitchen, we make back that plus more by not having to do all this prep time and separation. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And in fact, um, my father-in-law, Bob Wanger, uh, used to uh, tote uh, hams, uh, big hams on his shoulder uh, down into restaurants in Stanton back in the 30s and 40s. And um, on, their, on their little pig house on their farm, they, they had a little dairy and they would, they would uh, feed spoiled milk and whey and things like that to the pigs. And, um, um, he said, and, and, and his piggery, and this was common around this area, his piggery had two, like a step ladder going into the piggery from the exercise yard, and that was to make the pigs have to have to jump up this ladder, exercise their hams, because it made them better, it made the texture better. You know, when the, when the pork industry says pork the other white meat, it really ought to say the other white, slovenly, uh, anemic, iron deficient, carotenoid deficient, you know, junk taste looking. Slovenly meat, <laughs> because real, because real pork should be rose colored. It should have color, and it should have wonderful taste and texture. It's it's um, it's, it's a different deal. So um, the other thing we've learned from our chefs on this, some of them have actually done this. They've actually taken our pork and regular pork, and they've done a displacement test where they put ours in a beaker of water, you know, a pound of it, and measure the displaced water. And ours weighs far more per cubic inch. So it's much more dense. It's less cardboard and fluff. It's, it's the beer, not just the foam. It's the real deal, okay? As opposed to just being volumes of material that's just uh, um, fluff. So when we talk about nutrient density, we really mean density. The displacement 